I'm Father Ryan Humphreys. Welcome to the CU Catechast and our topic this week, the book of Daniel. Now, Daniel is the fourth of the so-called major prophets, and it's worth remembering that we're not saying that Elijah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Daniel are the four most important prophets of the Jewish faith. We're saying that they're Books are the four most important prophetic texts of the Old Testament. And so Daniel is a lot of fun because, one, it's the last of them. One, it's very apocalyptic literature. But it's also extra fun because it has a section that is considered apocryphal. And we'll get to that in a minute. I love to drive the Protestants crazy, and this is a hoot. Um, now, first, the book of Daniel is set in the middle of the Babylonian exile. So just like Baruch, Lamentation, Ezekiel, and third Isaiah, this is written while the Jews are in exile all over modern day Iran and Iraq, and after the kingdom in the north and in the south have both been destroyed and defeated by the Babylonian empire. And so we're looking at somewhere along the lines of the mid-500s B.C., but the book of Daniel was written, at least some parts of it written, a good deal later, probably down to 165 B.C., and we have no idea who the author is. It's called Daniel because he's the main character, but we have no sense whatsoever that someone named Daniel wrote the book or anything along the lines of that. Now, Daniel is a fun book to read. Just about every section has got something interesting in it, and it's a short book, 14 chapters, and they are chock full of interesting, bizarre, mystical stories. We've got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We've got the crazy hand on the wall writing Mene, Tekel, Perez. We've got the lion's den. It just keeps coming. I honestly don't know anyone in seminary or in real life who doesn't love reading the book of Daniel. And of course, you know, priests, we pray the breviary every day, which includes an extended reading from scripture. So at any one time, as priests are praying their breviary, we're making our way through a book of scripture. Some books are much more fun to get up and pray the office of readings and some are less fun. We're in the middle of 2 Corinthians right now, which is not as much fun to read. But but Daniel is by far my favorite after, of course, you know, Judith and the, the, the trilogy of, uh, of good action movies of the Old Testament. Daniel's a lot of fun to read. Overall, the theme of the book of Daniel is God's mystical supernaturality and his unlimited power. God is the master of the whole world, not just the Jews. He's the master of history. He's the master of the future. And if we entrust ourselves to him and him alone, no idols, absolutely no idol worship. That's a big deal for Daniel. If we entrust ourselves to God, then God will bless us in this life or the next. But Daniel cannot repeat it enough. If you mess with idols, you're out. So don't mess with idols. Can I say it again to you? Don't get involved in idol worship. And Daniel's going to repeat that about every 15th verse through the entire freaking book. Idols are bad. So let's make our way through the book. The easiest way to do this is going to be to kind of just look through the outline of the book. So scholars organize the book of Daniel into three sections. One, stories about Daniel, which is chapters 1 through 6. Then we have visions of Daniel, which is chapters 7 through 12. And then we're going to have more stories about Daniel for the last few chapters, which are really three stories that I can't explain to you, gun to my head, why Protestants don't accept the last two chapters of the book of Daniel. No clue. Not any idea whatsoever. None of the stories are dramatic. We're talking about the story of Susanna and the two elders who accuse her falsely. Nothing weird in that. And then we have a, a story about a mythical beast that the people believed was destroying you know, the, their, their, their city. Daniel shows up, and it literally just talks about killing a lizard. Not a dragon, a lizard. And yet, for whatever reason, that, I guess, is controversial to the point where people don't want it to. I have no idea. No clue why. Uh, I've, I've looked it up a couple of different books to get a reference point. It's just not in Protestant Bibles, and it is in ours. So Daniel chapter 13 and 14, you might open up your Bible at home, and it just may not be there. 
and I can't help you. It's on the internet. You can read it on the internet. Uh, it's in most of my Bibles, but not all of them. And I just, again, don't have a reason why. So if you have the extra two books, Daniel's in three parts. If you don't, Daniel is in two parts. So part one, six stories about Daniel. All of these should be vaguely familiar. The first is Daniel at the court in Babylon. So Daniel and his three companions, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, who are going to be renamed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are chosen for service in the household of the king because they are good people and they're smart and they're considered, you know, the right folks for the job, but they refuse to eat unclean food. This creates big problems, and it, the message of the story tends to be we've got to stand by the Lord and we've got to not worship idols, and if we do that, God will see us through even the difficult moments. So that's Daniel at the king of the, uh, of the court of the king in Babylon. Then chapter 2, we shift gears, and we have the four world empires and the eternal kingdom, which is an unwieldy long chapter. This is where the king Nebuchadnezzar, with a, of, of unpronounceable names, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreams about a statue. The head is gold, the torso is silver, the, uh, the breast and arms are silver, then there is the lower part is in bronze, and then the feet are partly iron and partly uh, clay. And so the king has no idea what this means. Daniel comes barreling in and interprets the dream for him. And of course, you know, the, the interpretation is true and there is great destruction of, of the worldly empires. And so now Daniel has some street cred, even though he's not obeying what the king tells him to do. Then chapter 3 is kind of the story of the three young men. This is the one that everybody uh, absolutely loves because this is the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so Nebuchadnezzar makes a large golden statue of himself, and he says when the music plays, everybody has to worship the statue. This should seem familiar. And so Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, a.k.a. Uh, 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 Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael refuse to bow down because, again, don't worship idols. They refuse to bow down, and of course, you know, they are caught by refusing to bow down, and so there's a giant furnace. We don't know what this furnace looks like, but the three, uh, the four men, rather, are all tied up and hurled into the furnace. The furnace is so hot that the people who throw them in die from burning as they're throwing them in because it's so, so, so hot. And then they look into the furnace, and what do they see? They see the four young men as well as someone that looks like a child of God dancing around in the flames. And so Nebuchadnezzar's people say, come out of there. And so Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel just stroll out of the furnace and go, Ta-da! And we have this kind of wonderful uh, uh, canticle where we have this almost psalm of the three young men that is sung. It's a wonderful, wonderful story. And of course, at this point, Nebuchadnezzar goes, maybe I'm not playing on even grounds here, and their God has got some real story to him, and so I may need to step it back a little bit. Then we're going to flip forward to the king who, in chapter 4, who at this point the king is taken aback. He's not sure what's going on. And so now we have uh, the king um, has another dream uh, that, that is, is problematic. It involves a tree. You'd read the, read the book. And then the king is at a supper. And everybody looks over, and oh, and this, my bad, man. This chapter four is where he cuts down a tree, and now Daniel comes in and interprets this story again. This is not as common. We don't hear this very often in the liturgy. Basically, the story is the king is going to lose his mind. He's going to go crazy for a little while, and now Daniel gets in trouble for interpreting a dream that is a negative news to the king. So he's interpreted the positive news, and he has praised for it. Now he's giving him a negative prophecy, and it's not so good. Chapter 5 is the most bizarre chapter in possibly the entirety of the Bible. And so you have, again, the king, uh, although now we have the king is Belshazzar instead of Nebuchadnezzar. Belshazzar is in this banquet and all of his people freak out because a giant hand appears on the wall 
and writes words on the wall. And the words that get written are mene, tekel, and perez, uh, words that mean measured, weighed, and divided in, in the particular language of the day. And so D Daniel is brought in again to interpret this incredibly bizarre thing. And Daniel interprets this to basically say, tonight the last king of the Persians will die. And we're not sad to see him go. And so what happens at the end of the chapter, of course, that night the king dies and the dogs lick the blood from the street in a visceral image. Why? Because don't worship idols. And then chapter 6, Daniel survives the lion's den. And so because Daniel has violated the law of the Persians, because he's lost favor with the kings, because he has consistently held by his principles and not worshipped idols, he's thrown into the lion's den. And as, of course, we know, they come the next morning and open it up, and there's the lion licking him like it's a chihuahua, and everything is fine, and Daniel comes out, and he has now got ultimate street cred, and nobody's going to mess with Daniel again. And so these six stories are wonderful. Every one of them are great, and they're all very readable. They're all very easy to digest. And while some of them you go, this is weird, you know, with the hand and the statue and whatnot, all of them make for really, really pleasant reading, and they make for decent meditation. Now, in chapter 2, we get the visions of Daniel, and we get five of them. It is not as easy to read these, so I'll kind of make my way through them just to give you a little bit of context, but they're more difficult. So chapter 7, Daniel has a vision, and he sees four beasts coming from the sea. These signify, he tells us, four empires. The ten horns of the fourth beast signify the ten kings of the Seleucid dynasty, and the little horn is Antiochus IV Epiphanes, the son of man prophecies. You know, this is not easy to get our head around, so don't fret if you read this and go, I'm not sure what's happening and what I'm supposed to take from this. That's okay. The only thing that you really kind of need to know is if you remember your, your history from the historical books, it is worth noting that the last of the beasts really does have significance with the, the stuff going on in Persia. But generally speaking, when people you know, look at this, they go, okay, this is interesting. The thing to take with you is that, that this mention of son of man, which we saw Ezekiel talking about, is going to be very important when it comes to understanding Jesus. So as you're reading, it's worth kind of taking note of that. But generally speaking, chapter 7 is just difficult. And the only thing that's probably good to have in the back of your mind is that the last beast signifies the Persians. In chapter 8, we have Daniel who runs into the ram, the he-goat, and the little horn. And this, of course, comes even more confusing. And basically, the only thing you want to know about this, because it's confusing, is that the great horn is Alexander the Great. When I say incomprehensible, I mean incomprehensible. Chapter 7 is hard. Chapter 8 is really hard. Um, you get this incredibly bizarre, confusing things. Uh, and the thing that makes them double confusing is they're very, very tied to that era in history. So it's not as if you know this prophecy somehow or another is relevant to Jesus. It's not as if I'm going to meditate upon this. This is all super, super specific. But what does, what we do want to kind of pay attention to as we're reading this, is how much this feels like the book of Revelation where we have all these weird symbolic animals that can't exist, you know, a, a goat with 10 eyes and 12 horns, you get a very, very clear sense where people reading the book of Revelation in the 100s AD would very, very clearly connect that with the book of Daniel coming from the 100s, 200s B.C., this is a book that would have been around long enough for them to know, and now they're seeing a new apocalyptic book in the book of Revelation, and they're going to feel connected to it. So the first six books or chapters of Daniel are super easy to read. The second ones are much, much more difficult, but that's okay because they're setting the stage for us to understand and, and get a sense of what the book of Revelation has to say. 
Uh, chapter 7, as I said, this, these empires. Chapter 8, these uh, animals. Chapter 9, Daniel is praying to understand the meaning of the 70 years that are mentioned by Jeremiah. Now we have the angel Gabriel showing up on the scene. We always like when they show up on the scene. And so chapter 9 is where we're going to meet a, a, uh, the archangel Gabriel. He is going to come and explain some things. He's going to talk about tribulations that will come, but don't worry, there's hope. Uh, the only thing we really need to take from that is, hey, there's Gabriel. Love it. Now we've met Raphael back in Tobit. We've got Gabriel here. He's a hoot. Uh, in chapters 10 and 11, Daniel is going to see a vision uh, again of Alexander the Great, uh, and this is really going to give us a sense of what apocalyptic literature looks like, but I would not feel overly frustrated if you're finding yourselves really struggling to make it through at this point, because this is about as confusing as it gets. Um, and then chapter 12, Daniel is going to, uh, or rather, um, Daniel sees a vision that the, that the trials are going to come to an end. Some people are going to be saved, some people aren't, but um, there is going to be a resurrection, not just of the good folks, but everybody. Everybody is going to live forever, some people in a good place, some people in a bad place. And so the first six chapters, very easy to get. The second chapter is difficult. If I really was going to say take something with you, read chapter 9. You can skip 7 and 8. Read chapter 9 because you're going to get to meet Gabriel. Uh, you can skip 10 and 11. Read 12 just because it's going to give you a sense of um, of what's going on, and we're going to get to really connect with the archangel Michael. So now we've got Gabriel, Mike, Gabriel, Michael, and uh, back in Tobit we met Raphael. So we almost have all the Ninja Turtles, and we have all the good guardian, the, all the good archangels uh, that we're going to meet in the Old Testament. And so very exciting. Now. Those are hard to read, and I would not give you any grief if you just say, I'm not going to read 7 through 10 entirely because it's tough, uh, or 7 through 12. The last two chapters, 13 and 14, again, I have no idea why they get omitted so often, are really easy. They're very good. So the story of Susanna, which you may or may not remember, comes down to there's a king, he's got a summer palace, and the guy next to him has this big, beautiful garden, this walled-in garden, and he wants to buy the walled-in garden, but there's drama associated with it, all kinds of stuff happens. Eventually, Susanna, who is a young woman who is innocent of anything that's necessarily bad, uh, goes into this garden and these two kind of old perverted people, they're judges um, of, of uh, Israel. These two people um, are basically lusting after her. She bathes in the garden. They go in to observe her. They say, you need to sleep with us, otherwise we'll, we'll basically have you executed. She says, no, no, I'm going to stand by the Lord. And then we have this whole kind of law and order scene where there's a mob outside, and they accuse her of doing these things. And because these two wise old judges are accusing the young, beautiful woman, they say, clearly, the young, beautiful woman is at fault. And then Dan Daniel comes in, you know, like Jerry Orbach or something, and says, hang on a minute, I've got new information. And he pulls them aside, and one says, oh, you know, she, she, they, they, they were sleeping together under the mastic tree. And another one says, oh, no, no, they were sleeping together under the broom tree. And Daniel has a lot of puns and plays on words, and ultimately the two old men are stoned to death for lying. And so you have all kinds of, of wonderful, uh, quirky things in history um, you have Shakespeare, of course, referencing this, this book more than once, where he, you, he talks about different things in courts of law. Uh, I have no idea why this isn't in Protestant Bibles, because it's one of the best books of the Old Testament, uh, or one of the best chapters of the Old Testament. So, so Susanna is chapter 13, and then 14, we have this weird story where basically uh, there is a group of people who are worshiping the idol of the false god Bell. And Bell is basically just any one of your, your classic false gods. And there is a priesthood set up around Bell. And so basically the deal is the people of this town have to sacrifice food 
in this kind of temple area. And so they got to bring in this food, all this food every day. And then the priests of Bel go in with their families and eat the food. Well, Daniel says, Bel is a lie, and I want to destroy him. And so Daniel says, basically, let's close up and lock this away and make sure Bel eats the food and not the priests. So they put the food in there, but it turns out that there's a secret back entrance. And so there's a secret staircase. And so sure enough, they, the priests sneak in the back way and eat all the food, and the people go, aha, you see, Bel is real. And Daniel goes, but wait. You don't know this, but I sprinkled flour all over the floor, and they couldn't tell. And so then when they open the thing the next morning, he looks down and goes, Aha, look at those. Those are Nike footprints. I can tell. Ha, 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 ha. And so you have this incredible over-the-top moment where the, the temple of Bel is destroyed. And because Bel takes the shape of a dragon, uh, Daniel is said to have slain the dragon. And then... In a somewhat connected story, there is a giant snake that maybe or maybe not has some vaguely lizard-like features, but it's not a dragon. But Daniel basically goes in the last chapter of the book and just brutally murders the snake because, you know, snakes are nasty and need to have their heads cut off sometimes, and there you go. So the first six chapters of the book of Daniel are great. The last two chapters of the book of Daniel are great. The middle chapters are difficult, but we do get to meet Gabriel and Michael, the archangels, and so that's always fun. Overall, I didn't do too bad on time, Daniel is a crazy book. Um, it is absolutely uh, engaging reading. Uh, it is apocalyptic literature, which I'm not going to talk about right now. I'm going to talk about when we get to the book of Joel. Uh, it is apocalyptic in that it is trying to show us uh, it uses mythological language to understand things that cannot be expressed in ordinary human conception. And so we have all these kind of completely bizarre and unexpected and hard to get our head around images because he's trying to explain something that he saw in a mystical vision that he's trying to explain to us. And so it's better for us just to get a little sense of Sometimes that looks like a weird statue made of things it wouldn't be made of. Sometimes that's a hand on the wall. Sometimes that's bizarre messages of angels. Um, and sometimes it's just a simple matter of, you know, tricking people by using a slapstick comedy to destroy evil people in the last two chapters of the book. So um, that's the, the best I could do in a short period of time without going through a much, much more complicated run through of it. Um, but that's the book of Daniel. So I hope that you take an opportunity to read it. It is absolutely worth your time. And if you don't in your Bible have chapters 13 and 14, the USCCB website at usccb.org definitely has chapters 13 and 14, and a lot of websites have it as well. Uh, and so if your Bible doesn't have it, definitely go read it. Uh, you will have heard the story of Susanna at some point. Um, you may or may not have heard the stories of Bell and the dragon, um, but they're worth reading too, uh, in part just because they're so kind of slapstick comedy. So that's it for the book of Daniel. I've been Father Ryan Humphreys. This has been the CU Catechast, and I hope you have a wonderful afternoon.